Well, good morning, South Union. Welcome back to each and every one of you. Welcome back to all of our guests and to all those who are listening in on uh, in online with us at this time or at a later time. Welcome. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and for your love, for your strength and for your kindness. We thank you so very much for your work in this world. We thank you for every breath that we have, every moment of life that we receive. We know is a gift from you and we thank you. We thank you so very much that we are able to worship. We thank you so very much for the celebrations of Christmas. Father Lord, we thank you so very much for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus, we thank you so very much for your incarnation, that you came down to dwell among us as a human being. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you so very much for the cross upon which you died to atone for our sin. We thank you so very much for the resurrection. Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and well and seated at the right hand of God. Father and Jesus, we thank you so very much for your Holy Spirit, whom you have given to all who believe in you. We thank you. Now, Father, we do pray that you would be with us in this time to hear your word to each and every one of us this morning, whether it's a word of encouragement, a word of consolation, a word of comfort, a word of repentance, a word of knowledge, a word of instruction, whatever it is that you have for us, I pray that you would give it to us this day. In your name do we pray. Amen. As an American church, we need to recapture the courage and power of God to fight total war against sin and all forms of evil. We have uh, different, so today one of the things that we're doing is summarizing our Christmas sermon series, and I always almost add an additional Advent theme, which is why we're still doing Advent themes, and today we're looking at the Advent theme of peace, and we know that there are different types of peace. There's a peace with an inner sort of peace, where we have balanced emotions, and we're, we're nice and calm and doing all that sort of stuff. We have peace within our relationships. Right, which means that there's a lack of conflict in them. We have peace at the national level, which means there's a lack of conflict at that national level. The key sort of peace that we need to talk about today is peace with God. And what we're going to find from our text today is that peace with God always means that there is war happening at the same time. For to have peace with God means that we are always at war with the world, with sin, and with the flesh. And what I would like us to receive from this sermon or consider doing is to be committed to learning a deeper hatred against sin. It is my prayer that we will take up the cause of hating evil and sin in all forms as our New Year's resolution. Let's take a look at our text for today and we'll dive right in. See Proverbs chapter 8 verse 13. It's one of these very interesting statements. There's about, oh, somewhere between six to eight different, the fear of the Lord is blanks in the book of Proverbs. This happens to be one of them. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Where the translation read earlier is more accurate. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. 
Now, what's the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord, and remember we did a study on this about two years ago, so we should all just recall it immediately, right? The fear of the Lord means a reverent awe, a sort of love, a reverent awe and love for God. That's what the fear of the Lord is. It's a reverent awe and love of God. And we remember, of course, that at the beginning of the book of Proverbs, we see that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. It's that cornerstone for it. And now here what we see is that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, or we might say this, to revere God with awe and love means to hate evil. So how do we how do we express this differently when when God when Jesus says love God with all your heart mind soul and strength and love your neighbor as yourself and we all want to be about doing that command part of loving God well means detesting evil that's what part of loving God well means so we need to then capture a full understanding of what's going on here. First, hatred is a verb. This is an active hating of evil. It's something that is done. It is not passive. It is uh, filled with action. Evil is all things that stand against God. Evil is all things that stand against the will of God. Now, at this point in time, we may be saying, well, this is a sort of awkward command. Does this exist anywhere else in Scripture? Absolutely. Turn with me. We're going to go on a, a whirlwind tour through some Scriptures here. We're going to do two at first, and then we're going to go into more a little later. Turn with me to the book of Romans. Chapter 12. Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Romans is sort of one of Paul's theological masterpieces. And here he is moving into um, what is supposed to define a Christian in their ethical life, right? What's a Christian supposed to do? And he says this in verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil hold fast to what is good what does abhor mean that's a fantastic word right abhor means to hate strongly or find repugnant it means it creates this nasty odor that gives you the expression you can't help on your face does anybody sort of know what sort of odor i'm talking about I'll just kind of define this for us. I was going to save this story for later, but I'll share it now. Uh, my son, Thomas, is just a, a wonderful boy. We just love him dearly. And when he was younger and still an infant and he started to eat baby food, what we would always do is we would blend up avocado. And we would put avo and give him, we'd feed him avocado like three times a day, every day. It's supposed to be fantastic for the skin and brain, right? So we would just stuff him full of avocado. Well, when he was old enough to really will his own will, about the age of two, he started to abhor avocado. If he saw green stuff that looked like avocado, he would not let it near him. Right? I mean, he would just start pitching a fit as soon as he saw the stuff. And we didn't blame him. We had fed it to him every day for like a year and a half. So we, we didn't really blame him. But he finds it repugnant to this day. Now it's two years later. To this day, he still will not touch avocado. He won't let it near his lips. He won't allow it on his plate. He'll push it. He says, that stuff is nasty. I will have none of it. That's what it means to abhor something. So he finds it repugnant. Abhor what is evil. Turn with me to the little book of Jude. 
The letter to Jude is um, right before Revelation, so simply turn to the end and then make a left. And it's only it should only be a single page or maybe two if you have a study Bible in your Bibles. Very small letter. The letter to Jude says this in verses 22 and 23. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now, the garment means their clothes. But, uh, the, 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 Jude, the author, Jude, is not literally meaning hate their clothes. What he's saying is, hate the lifestyle that they're wrapped up in. And he doesn't tell you to hate the person. He says, show mercy to them with fear. But what do you do? Hate the outer part. Hate the lifestyle that they're in. And here's the difficult truth for us this morning. If we want peace with God... We must love what God loves and hate what God hates. Loving God entails hating evil, not just disliking it like it's a cobweb in the corner or a stain in the carpet that won't come out. Anybody have those stains in their carpet? Right? A few of you are laughing. Some of us do. I was going to tell a story. We're going to move on, though. Don't just dislike it. Hate it. it. Hate then, and thinking about that word abhor and repugnant and hate, hate is to um, find something repulsive, gut twisting, as in, I'm getting sick over this sin. And we have to understand this. Hate is an emotive word. It is an emotional word, not just something in the intellect. What do I mean? It is not just a, well, you know, that's something wrong and bad to do. It is a down here as well, twisting of the gut. I am sick over this sin. And we all know, we all have those touch points with evil where we really do get sick over it. So let's say, okay, we have it with those certain touch points. There are certain things if people mention that we might start to feel like we want to vomit. It's to do that with all evil, with all forms of sin. So what is it that God doesn't like? Well, actually, here in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, we see wisdom is speaking. And so first, what we're going to see is what wisdom hates. And if wisdom hates it, God also hates it. We're going to see that. But let's talk about verse 13 first. It says this, pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance are attitudes of the heart. It's attitudes that value one's own thoughts and ways above everyone else, including God. It is the way that refuses to submit to Scripture. That's pride and arrogance. And it's really important to note this. Um, pride and arrogance could be found in somebody submitting to Scripture, but... If somebody is standing on the word of God and refusing to move, that is not pride or arrogance because it's not putting oneself above all else. What's it doing? It's putting the word of God above all else. There's something to balance us out. If you flip over to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 26 you'll see this beautiful metaphor that the proverb, author of Proverbs gives us, with re, which reveals a powerful truth on this subject. It says this, Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain is a righteous man who gives way before the wicked. Travesty. Pride and arrogance is not the righteous giving way before the wicked. Uh, I'm sorry, pride and arrogance is not the righteous standing up to the wicked and saying no. 
That is not pride and arrogance that's standing on Scripture. And so we need to carefully parse that out because many times if we're standing on the Word of God, we're standing on Scripture, many people might tell us that we're being prideful or arrogant. How could you have that point of view about these certain evils? I'm not being pride and arrogant. What we're doing is submitting to Scripture, and that's righteousness. But pride and arrogance in the attitude of our hearts is what is to be hated. Back to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil. This is the walking out of evil in the life of a person. And third, what happens is pride and arrogance leads to walking in the way of evil. And then you have this third part, which looks to cover up the first two. It says, and perverted speech I hate. Now, we might have some different definitions of perverted speech. Let me tell you what it is here in Scripture. Perverted, script, perverted Scripture, oh man. Perverted speech in Scripture is the idea of twisting the truth into a lie in order to cover up for one's misdeeds. That's what perverted speech is. It's taking the truth, you twist it into a lie, and you share that lie in order to cover up for the way of evil and pride and arrogance. You might say this, it's self-defense or self-justification by the twisting of truth and reality. Perverted speech. What else does God not like? Flip over with me to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. And I misspoke there. You see how common it is? It's not just a dislike. This is stuff the Lord hates. Look here in verses 16 through 19 of Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. Here we go. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. That's pride and arrogance. A lying tongue, that's perverted speech. Hands that shed innocent blood, that's murder. A heart that devises wicked plans, that's a mastermind of sin. Feet that make haste to run to evil, that's the willingness to carry out evil deeds. A false witness who breathes out lies, that's talking specifically about the court of law. And lying in a trial. And one who sows discord among brothers. One who is purposefully out to divide a family. But there are other things that we can find the Lord hates. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. Chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. I won't be defining or explaining all of these. If you would like to, you can... Hunt through our Galatians Bible study online, and we go over each of these in depth. Here are things that he hates. And these things are the, the, what he hates because they are desires of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and on. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Meaning, folks, there, there shouldn't be a brainstorm needing to happen about what is evil. It should be obvious to us. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. It's not an exhaustive list. It's representative. All the stuff that looks like that, evil. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Turn with me now to one more passage here. Revelation chapter 21. This is, again, a representative list. It's not exhaustive. 
meaning that the author doesn't need to list everything that there is that's evil. It simply gives you a taste test because why? All the evil stuff is self-evident. All right. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Those are descriptive ways of life of people who will be thrown into hell. If we want to stand against evil, we must stand against all of those things. And we must not just stand against it, we must hate it. If you want peace with God, it means don't have peace with the world. You must hate sin. And now we need to enter into our practical application. Many forms, of, and this is just an assertion, it's a claim that I'm going to make that you need to analyze for yourself. And I think that you'll find it to be true, at least in part, at least in part for all of us. There are many sins in our culture that are so prevalent, we are desensitized to it. And what I mean by that is we no longer feel anything about it. Remember, to hate is a feeling word. But we don't hate it anymore. What we do is we stand against it intellectually and we'll make insertions like this. I would never do that. That is evil. That is sin. It exists up here and is absent down here. And by the gut, I mean it's just absent in the source of our feelings. The propagation, for example, of sex outside of marriage, cohabitation, and pornography. The propagation of violence and murder is all so prevalent in our society that we may not feel anything against it or we may not even consider it a big deal. Well, so-and-so is marrying, or so-and-so is living with somebody else before marriage. What a shame. That's the extent of it. Oh, so-and-so was murdered in some county. Oh, how terrible. Right, we read it in the newspaper. Hear it on the news. Oh, that's, that's just awful. And the question is, is there any feeling with it? We have shows in the American culture that, that, that exalt evil. Miami Vice. It's literally there in the title. And it's about exalting evil. We have, we have shows that are, that are, that, that simply propagate and desensitize us to evil. Shows like Seinfeld. Seinfeld is one big cluster show of people doing wrong and evil and smiling all the way through it to make you laugh about it. It's a show about absolutely nothing. And it's evil. People sleep with each other all the time. People lie, cheat, steal, do all sorts of things. And we go, ha, 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 ha. Oh, that was, can't wait for the rerun next week. There are video games among our youth meant to desensitize people to evil. There's a, there's a video game called Grand Theft Auto. It exalts stealing cars, killing people, stealing items, and sex outside of marriage, as well as a whole proliferation of other things. Blockbuster video game, one of the best selling on the market. Smile. It's going to get really hard now. It's really easy to do this with all the sins from other people that are on the outside. There we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in that boat. I'm not desensitized to that stuff. 
The worst is the desensitization of our own sins. The repeated actions and behaviors that we no longer feel anything about and may actually like them. If grace is still upon us, the Lord have mercy on all of us, we may still have the vague thought that runs through our mind, this is sin. If grace is working in us, we may still have the thought, this is sin, and this is wrong. And if we're not, we may just begin to shrug our shoulders and say, well, this is natural. Just normal. And that means we are seriously in trouble. Now, here's the thing. We're dwelling in the realm of thoughts there. Guess what's absent if we're simply thinking that this is sin and we actually like it? What's absent is the hatred of that sin, the re revulsion over it, the, the, the sense that this is repugnant to me. And what we're challenged in the Proverbs text is it's not just up here in our thoughts, but it's down here in our bellies. There is a hatred of it. And here's the thing, thought by itself has little ability to affect what you and I do. That's why so many times, even, even when you have planned out the method and, and you know exactly what you're going to do to conquer a sin, when I know it exactly what I'm going to do to conquer a sin, and we lay it out and we have this beautiful plan in place and we have the intention to do it, the reason why we still fail is because there's no hatred of what we're looking to conquer. It needs both. I'm not saying don't use your thoughts. Absolutely think and use your thoughts. But there also must be that feeling that drives us to action to conquer the sin. We need both thoughts and careful planning, intention and the abhorrence, the revulsion about the evil. Now here's the thing. Hatred is not the same thing as anger. And we need to hear that, especially when we're relating to other people, but also when we're relating to ourselves. The idea is, don't get, is not to get angry over it. Hatred is a revulsion, a deep dislike for. Anger means I am hurting or in pain or something is not going my way. Now, you may get over it, but Proverbs 8, you may get angry over it, but Proverbs 8.13 does not say the hatred, uh, the fear of the Lord is getting angry about evil. It says the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. So what do we do? First, pray that God gives us an intense hatred for sin in our lives. Start with us. This is something that I myself have had to repent over, which is the second step. Be honest with God and repent if we no longer hate evil. In my own journey, there's, there's some sins that I'm looking to conquer and overcome, and I've been working on it and thoughtfully planning and brainstorming, and I'm like, what, what's going on? Why can't I destroy this sin in the life? Why isn't the Holy Spirit doing anything about it? And then I read this text for months, and I realized something. The single greatest hindrance to my spiritual growth was a lack of hatred for sin. The reason I couldn't destroy it was because I didn't hate it. I didn't abhor it. Well, where's the hatred to come from? Like in all things in the spiritual life with, in Christianity, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to help. God, I repent. I am so sorry. Not just for the sin, but the fact that I didn't hate the sin. And now also, Father God, I need your help because I want to hate sin, but I don't. Help me to hate it. Make it so that whenever, whenever I'm going towards that sin or whatever I'm looking to do, that, that my belly begins to twist. And I begin to abhor, and I almost like I want to vomit over it. 
Think that'll keep you away from your sin? Think it'll keep it away from me from mine? Anybody with me there? Yeah. Just like Thomas with the avocado, right? If your belly twists over it, you're not going to go near it. It's the same thing in our spiritual life. So first, pray, and second, repent. And third, if there's ever been a time where we have refused to stand against evil, or where we have let evil into our lives, or where we have not hated it in others, we also need to repent. We need to ask God for forgiveness for that. This is, again, another area in which, which I have deeply got to repent because my attitude up to this point has been, well, somebody else is sinning. If they ask about it or it comes up in conversation, I'll tell them it's sin. But I'm so desensitized to so many things. I can sit across from, the, from a table with somebody who's in sin. I don't think anything of it. Just nothing. I watch all of it on the television that I want. I don't feel any hatred for it. Is anybody else with me? Am I the only one that's desensitized to this stuff in our culture? No. Right? I don't think anything of it. And yet this text is telling us to hate sin. Third, Always work in the positive. Continue to love people and push people toward the goal that God has for us. If they are not saved, the first step is not sin. The first step is Jesus. And that's going to involve pointing out sin and making people know their sin so they can repent and receive him as Savior. But don't expect them to conquer anything without Jesus. So the first step, if someone's not saved, is Jesus. The gospel. And then after that, it's inviting people to pray for that revulsion. It's, it's, it's pointing it out in scripture. It's saying, hey, look, we need to move here because this is what God has for us and wants for us. Never just give the negative. Always give the positive that somebody is to move into. Here's the space. Here's the movement that needs to take place. May our New Year's resolution this year be both awkward and powerful. May we resolve to hate evil, not just some of it, not just what's in others, but all of it all the time. May we then be driven to be done with it in our lives and live with God. This will lead to greater peace with God, though you will always continue to wage an ever more severe war. Do you hear that? We are not done until we're in heaven. This, this, this waging of war, this, 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 draw, this abhorrence, this hatred of evil will lead to a greater peace with God though you will wage an ever more severe war against the flesh, against sin, and against all the evil in this world. Happy New Year. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, we thank you so very much for you. We thank you so very much that for all those who believe our sin is past, that you have forgiven all, and that you have promised to forgive every misstep along the way. But Father, we, we want to go more with you. We want to go deeper with you. We want a greater peace with you. Father God, help us to hate evil, not just with our minds, but with our minds and our hearts and our souls and our very bodies. Make it a total revulsion to us. Father, we believe that you can do it. And Lord, we know that we can't do it on our own. Holy God, 
please come and conform us ever greater into the image of your Son. In the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.